We're going to turn now to First Minister's questions. The first question from Jackson Carlo. Uh, presiding officer, uh, yesterday the Scottish Government demanded an urgent debate on which flags should be flown on the pavement outside this building. Uh, will the First Minister now support my demand for a statement next week on why her government is failing to meet its own target to improve education in Scotland's most deprived schools. First Minister. Uh, well, it's for the Business Bureau to decide the business of Parliament, but I'm very happy for this government to... Very happy for this government to, to give statements on the work we are doing to improve education. Uh, the Attainment Fund, uh, which of course uh, we see uh, at national level points to an improving system. So, for example, the gaps between school leavers from the most deprived and least deprived areas is narrowing, as we've uh, covered in this chamber many times before, more young people leaving school with hires, more young people leaving school with five hires, uh, more young people leaving school with National Five qualifications. Uh, so work to do, yes, but uh, we're getting on with that job and I'm sure the Deputy First Minister will always be happy uh, to advise the Chamber on that progress. Jackson Carlow. I'm pleased to have the First Minister's support for that statement next week and I'm sure the Bureau will have taken note. But I think this week it's been all too clear what the First Minister's priority really is and it's not raising the standard of education in our schools. Her government has set out a range of targets that need to be met to help close the attainment gap between pupils in our wealthiest and poorest communities. These include targets that 68% of primary pupils from Scotland's most deprived areas should meet the required standards in literacy by the end of this school year, and that 75% should meet that standard for numeracy. First Minister, tell us on the basis of the most recent figures available, will those targets be met? First Minister. Well, our schools across the country, backed by education authorities in our local councils, uh, are working with teachers to meet those targets. It's right that we uh, set stretching, ambitious targets. That is what we have done. And I think it is wrong uh, to say right now that our schools uh, are not working to meet those targets. As I said in my original answer, if you look at the situation across uh, the country, we have evidence already that points to the improvements in the system. If we look at the gaps between uh, those from the most deprived and least deprived, we uh, see that gap narrowing. We now have full-time attainment advisors uh, in place in each local authority working in a focused way with our schools to make sure uh, that we meet those targets. In December, we published the most comprehensive set of data and evidence on performance in education through the National Improvement Framework um, and we will continue to set out that detail and we will be held to account on that. But what I will do is back our teachers to get on with the job of making the improvements that we are seeing across Scottish education. Carlo. Well, that sure sounds like a First Minister getting in her excuses early. And we all have a profound respect for the work done by our teachers, but it does the First Minister no credit to hide behind their hard work to mask her own government's failures. From analysis published this week, there's little cause for optimism. Glasgow University say there needs to be a tenfold, tenfold increase in progress seen in the last three years in just one year. Progress where it exists at all is taking place with nothing like the urgency required. Next to no progress in closing the attainment gap in primary or secondary school when it comes to literacy and numeracy. And today, today we learn that since the introduction of the SNP's botched curriculum for excellence in 2015, the pass rate in... The pass rate... Order, please. Let's hear the question. The pass rate in 32 of the 46 higher subjects has dropped in English, maths, chemistry and history. Progress, First Minister, is any of this any way acceptable? First Minister. Address all of these points. Firstly, in terms of the direction of travel in Scottish education, whether it's in exam passes, and I'll come back to that point in a moment, or the narrowing of the attainment gap, if Jackson Carlow doesn't want to take my word for it, then let me quote the International Council of Education Advisors, and I'm quoting directly here, Scotland is heading in the right direction and taking the right approach to improving education. That is what we will continue to do. Uh, let me turn to uh, the uh, pass rates that Jackson Carlow has talked about today. Firstly, as I've said repeatedly, overall, more young people leave school with hires. Two-thirds now get at least one. That compares to less than half when we took office. 
30% get five or more hires. Uh, that compares to 22% in 2009. But let's look at the different subjects, uh, the 32 subjects uh, that Jackson Carlaw talked about. Firstly, uh, we've committed to publishing our analysis of the exam results and it is absolutely uh, right that we look at the reasons where uh, exam pass rates are falling uh, and I'm not suggesting for a second that some of the subjects I am about to talk about are not important they are all very important but where we see yes classical studies for example uh, down maths is up uh, yes drama down but physics is up uh, geography is up and when you look at the top 10 uh, subjects in Scotland, most of them have exam pass <laughs> rates going up. Mathematics, chemistry, modern studies, physics, biology, geography, all up yeah. since 2015. Yeah. So I'm not saying we don't look at uh, the subjects where the opposite is true. We are doing that. But the overall picture, as is so often the case, is not the one that Jackson Carlaw wants to yeah. present. Jackson Carlaw. Do you know, that really was lamentable. We are seeing a drop in 32, 32 of 46 higher subjects. And I think people are getting increasingly angry at the First Minister's spin and denial of the failure of education under her government. Being on course to miss all four of your own educational attainment targets is a definition of failure. It's as simple as that. Primary and secondary, literacy and numeracy, Four areas the SNP said they'd change things for good, four areas they're failing. Record low scores in maths and science, missed targets in the attainment gap, and today those falling pass rates in the vast majority of higher subjects. First Minister, how many more times do we have to listen to the same lines and excuses about how education is your government's number one priority when the actual evidence shows your record is one of unmitigated continuing failure? First Minister. On what Jackson Carlaw has just described as, as lamentable, uh, the 10 top subjects in our education system, the one uh, that there are the highest number of entries for, the ones that most pupils do, uh, the majority of them, compared to 2015, which is what Jackson Carlaw is putting to me, have pass rates that have improved. Now, he might not think that matters, but let me again just talk about the subjects that we are focusing on here. Maths pass rate up since 2015, uh, up in chemistry, in modern studies, in physics, in biology, in geography, two thirds of those top 10 subjects. That doesn't suit Jackson Carlaw's argument, but that's the achievement of pupils uh, and yeah. teachers across our country. He might want to talk it down, but I think that is what is disgraceful. So we will continue to make the investment and we will continue to focus on where improvements are needed. Uh, I never uh, shy away from saying that, but I will not stand here while Jackson Carlaw talks down education in Scotland in the way he does. Question number, question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, the SNP government uh, claimed that their so-called non-profit distributing model took the profit motive and the shareholder dividend out of the building and running of public infrastructure projects in Scotland. But this week's Audit Scotland and Accounts Commission report order, blows a order. hole in that claim. First Minister, do you accept their conclusions or are you in denial? First Minister. Do you know, I, when I was thinking about what Richard Leonard uh, might ask me about today, I thought, he won't really go on PFI, <laughs> will he? But he has, and who am I to complain? So let me firstly give the background. Uh, we use the non-profit distributing uh, model because if we hadn't done that, because of the six billion cumulative cut to our capital budget imposed by the Tories, we wouldn't have been able to build the 117 uh, schools, the hospitals and the other public sector buildings. We did that through a system where we made improvements on uh, Labour's PFI, so profit Labor. capping. Under Labour's PFI, if surpluses were made, do you know where they went? They went into the pockets of investors. Under our system, surpluses, surpluses got reinvested into the public sector. Under Labour PFI projects, the repayments, the repayments under Labour's projects amounted amount, because they're still being paid, 
to five and a half times the capital value of the project. We got that down to just three and a half times. So we made the improvements that Labour didn't make. And I can't believe that Richard Leonard has got the brass neck to stand up here and talk about PFI. Richard Leonard. Uh, well, presiding officer, I, I anticipated last night how the First Minister might respond to my first question. So I went back to look at a report which I wrote 25 years ago, and here is an extract from it. Here's the report. The PFI is something of a contract Order. predicated on a buy now, pay later mirage. It is a mirage because the taxpayer or the user will simply pay more in the end. It is smart accountancy, but bad economics. The fact is that government can always borrow Keep at a lower down, interest please. rate than the private sector. So I have been consistent on this question as the First Minister. The Accounts Commission this week conclude that the Scottish Government have failed to properly monitor and evaluate billions of pounds worth of privately financed contracts. Mr Leonard, Mr Leonard, just hold on one second. That's an unacceptable level of noise. I'm sorry, but we should, we should treat each other with respect in this chamber. Please listen to the questions being put and then answer them in a respectful way and less of this barracking. Mr Leonard, Mr Leonard. The Accounts Commission conclude that without proper transparency and accountability, the risks increased and the costs have skyrocketed. We pay three times the capital value of assets in unitary charges alone. It is what the Accounts Commission described this week as, and I quote them, the private finance cost premium. First Minister, why for the last 13 years have you presided over this rip-off? First Minister. Well, firstly, on capital value, Richard Leonard says uh, NPD projects uh, cost three times the capital value. That's a vast improvement on the five and a half times the capital value yeah. under Labour schemes. On transparency, under the old uh, Labour-supported schemes, you used to have to wait after 20, uh, 25 years after the asset was complete before you got the yeah. information about it. We now publish uh, most of that material two years after an asset is complete, so much greater transparency. But Richard Leonard, uh, bless, wrote a report <laughs> 25 years ago. Isn't it a real shame that the Labour governments who followed in the years after that ignored everything Richard Leonard said and it took an SNP government to act on the things that he said. <laughs> Capping the... <laughs> Capping... Capping the profits on the projects, making sure that surpluses go back into the public sector, not into the pockets of investors like Labour uh, used to allow to happen. And my last point, presiding officer, and I, I, I will be brief, I, I, sorry, I, I maybe I'm enjoying myself too much here, but I will be <laughs> brief. Uh, Richard Leonard says, rightly, public borrowing would be cheaper. Yes, of course, but we didn't have the power to <laughs> borrow publicly because Labour preferred those powers to stay with the Tories at Westminster than have them here in the Scottish Parliament. So if that is belated support for increasing the borrowing powers of this Parliament, then maybe we've made some progress after all today. Richard Leonard. We are, well, we are in favour of increasing the borrowing powers of this Parliament, and we are against, and we are against PFI, NPD and all its successor bodies. But I'll tell you this, instead of using this parliament to speak to your party about a divisive referendum which the people don't want and obsessing about a flag, never mind the symbolism of a flag, let's look at the symbolism of a sick kids hospital in this city. A hospital that will not open for over a year but which is costing £1.4 million a month in charges which proves, as this week's report by Audit Scotland shows, that with your finance model, we have a transfer of reward to the private sector, but no transfer of risk. Yes. First Minister, 
This week has shown that you have got the wrong priorities. Tomorrow, tomorrow you are speaking to your party faithful. So today, why don't you speak to the patients, to the families, to the staff who are being let down in this city? Why don't you take this opportunity to focus on their priorities? First Minister. I think Richard Leonard should just be relieved that tomorrow he's not speaking to his party faithful because they would be in utter despair uh, based on what we have just heard. You know, we, we use the non-profit distributing model because the Tories uh, cut over the decade we've just had. They've taken £6 billion cumulatively out of our capital budgets and we didn't have borrowing powers. In the last couple of years, we've got very, very limited borrowing powers, which we're using to the full. Uh, but Labour, of course, didn't support borrowing powers coming to this Parliament. So instead of continuing to use PFI, instead of continuing to use uh, the PFI that was such a bad deal for taxpayers and the public that Labour favoured, we uh, introduced a new scheme that capped the profits uh, while transferring risk, that didn't allow, didn't allow surpluses to go to investors and reduced the overall costs to the taxpayer. That's what we did after Labour for all these years presided over the PFI scandal. So I think Richard Leonard, notwithstanding what he wrote 25 years ago, should have a long, hard look at Labour on this issue before he comes to the SNP. Thank you. There's a, a, a huge number of members wanting to ask supplementaries today. Hopefully we'll get through some of them, uh, quite a few of them. Graeme Simpson to be followed by Stuart McMillan. <clears throat> Presiding officer, Apex property factor was struck off the factors register in April last year after a string of breaches of the Code of Conduct. An appeal was heard in December and it was refused. They did not appeal again. Kevin Stewart wrote to former clients of Apex on January the 13th to tell them the good news. But three days later, constituents of mine in Motherwell received another letter on Apex-headed paper citing an ongoing legal dispute and saying that an associate company, Clean Cut Limited, spelt with two Ks, had been established to ensure continuity of maintenance services. My constituents have since received another letter and an invoice. It's an appalling and outrageous situation, and I know that MSPs across this chamber have concerns about it. Um, so would the First Minister agree to look at providing homeowners in this situation with extra help to help them find new factors, and would she agree with me that the process for removing bad factors takes far too long and that this case has highlighted a loophole that should be closed. Yeah. First Minister. Well, I, um, obviously, g given the nature of the constituency, I represent with lots of tenemental properties. I deal with constituents uh, who have issues with factors regularly. So I know some of uh, the frustrations, uh, understandable frustrations that people have, although that said, there are a lot of uh, factors who do a very uh, good job as well. Uh, the reason we have a, 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 fact, a property factors registered and uh, companies can be removed is to make sure that high standards uh, are applied. Um, we will always look, and I'm more than happy to look at this case. I don't know all of the details about what Apex uh, are doing in terms of the letters they're sending out, but it is absolutely essential that the system we have works to protect homeowners. So I'm happy if uh, Graeme Simpson wants to uh, send me or the Housing Minister the details of the letters that he's referred to today for us to look into it and see what more action, if any, the Scottish Government is able to take. Thank you. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Donald Cameron. Thank you, Presiding Officer. What assistance can the Scottish Government offer Inverclyde to improve Greenock Town Centre as a result of the SIMD stats produced this week? And does the First Minister agree with me that the suggestion from Dr Alf Baird at the REC Committee yesterday to stop building the two vessels at Ferguson Marine in Port Glasgow but build four smaller ships in China instead is not likely to improve the SIMD stats across Inverclyde as a whole? First Minister. Uh, well, we're investing significantly in communities that face disadvantage. For example, last year over £1.4 billion was spent in targeting support at low-income households. Uh, specific to Greenock, we're supporting investment through the £500 million Glasgow City Region Growth Deal, uh, which Inverclyde Council is a full partner in. Uh, we're making £45 million available to Inverclyde Council uh, across this parliamentary term to support regeneration uh, and provide uh, affordable, energy-efficient housing. And we've made over £20 million available to Inverclyde 
applied through the Attainment Scotland Fund, uh, with six million of that available this year. Uh, SIMD data is a helpful tool to support targeting resources across the public sector, and we will continue to work in partnership with local government and others to support uh, reducing inequality and the regeneration of towns uh, and cities. On the shipbuilding point, I absolutely agree uh, with Stuart McMillan that we want to see uh, ships build he here and uh, in particular where appropriate in Ferguson's uh, rather than see them go to China or anywhere else. Donald Cameron to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Um, the First Minister will be aware that earlier this morning a significant landslip led to the closure of the A83 at the Rest and Be Thankful Pass where drivers currently forced to take a local diversion. Landslips regularly close this section of road, cutting off huge swathes of Argyll and the West Highlands, and many communities and businesses are at their wit's end as a result. Will the First Minister now concede that papering over the cracks is simply not working, and that a long-term, permanent solution is urgently required? First Minister. Well, I am aware uh, of the very difficult situation. This lands landslip that has happened earlier this morning, as I understand it, is in a different area to uh, where they have uh, been experienced uh, in past uh, years. Uh, obviously, we have done a lot of work over past years to uh, make the reserve uh, road available, although I understand that that is not necessarily available uh, today. Uh, Transport Scotland and others are exploring this situation. We will want to make sure that the road is open as quickly as possible, but safety is a key priority. And of course, in the context of our wider transport strategy, we will continue to look at uh, further improvements that can be made. But I absolutely understand uh, the inconvenience and the frustration uh, that travellers who use this road uh, will be experiencing today. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, tomorrow councillors in North Lanarkshire will have to vote in the future of the Kilbao Outdoor Centre located in Oban. The facility offers every P7 pupil in North Lanarkshire, many from some of our most deprived communities, the opportunity for a residential week away to build self-esteem and improve learning through outdoor activity. The SNP Council Group have now already stated that they will vote against this proposal. Will the First Minister join me in calling for the ruling Labour Group or North Lanarkshire Council to put our young people first and to take the closure of this vital facility off the table? First Minister. Uh, well, obviously this is a matter for the local council, but I would uh, agree with Fulton McGregor about uh, the importance of outdoor learning. It delivers uh, numerous benefits, including improved mental and physical health. Uh, it helps to increase academic attainment and give an appreciation of the natural environment. And indeed, that's why it is built into the school curriculum. I'll certainly ask the Education Secretary to look into the particular issue and provide Fulton McGregor with a more detailed response in due course. Elaine Smith to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, President Officer. Can I draw the Chamber's attention to my register of interests, where I'm the convener of the RMT parliamentary group. And as such, I understand from the union that the Freightliner Freight Terminal in Coatbridge is currently under threat of closure. So can the First Minister advise if the rail freight fund announced by the Scottish Government just last year at the Coatbridge Terminal can be used to safeguard its future and the hundred jobs that may be affected? <laughs> First Minister. Uh, well, I'm very happy to look into the speci specifics of that and come back uh, to the member uh, with a detailed answer. We would certainly want to be doing uh, everything we can to help uh, secure the future. Um, and if that fund is available, then we would want to make sure that it is. But rather than uh, give a categoric answer to that point today, I want to have the opportunity to look into it and come back properly. John Mason to be followed by Jamie Halker Johnson. Hey, thanks very much. The First Minister will be aware that there was another march uh, last Saturday in Glasgow, and one of the results was that a police officer was injured. Can she give any assurance that maybe the number of marches happening in Glasgow could be reduced because they are a real frustration to both residents and businesses? First Minister. Uh, well, I understand uh, that frustration. I'm very clear, and I've said this in the Chamber before, that peaceful protest is an important part of our democracy. But violent and sectarian disruption should have no part in our democracy or our society. Uh, we support Police Scotland to take appropriate action to deal with disorder like that that was witnessed on Saturday to ensure public safety and uh, what we saw on Saturday was unacceptable. Uh, the Scottish Government supports local authorities in making decisions to achieve the, the right balance between the rights of marchers and the rights of communities affected and I am certainly encouraged by Glasgow City Council's cross-party response to marches and parades and I look forward to hearing any recommendations that that group uh, will bring forward. And Jamie Halker Johnson. Uh, as I've read with the First Minister before, the maternity unit at Dr Grace Hospital in Elgin has been downgraded since 2018, with many expectant mothers having to undertake long journeys to Aberdeen and Inverness to give birth or receive vital care. However, this week it's been reported that one expectant mother from Murray was forced to travel as far as Fife 
over 160 miles away because the Ragmore and Aberdeen maternity hospitals were at capacity. With Murray being hit by winter weather this week, I'm sure the First Minister will agree with me and with families across Murray that this is simply unacceptable. So will the First Minister now intervene to ensure that her Health Secretary acts in the interest of local families and takes urgent, direct action to restore full maternity services in Murray as a priority? First Minister. Well, the Health Secretary will actually be visiting Dr Gray's on the 11th of February to uh, discuss these very issues. Um, I agree absolutely that it is important that uh, women are cared for and get to deliver uh, their babies as close to home as possible, in particular uh, in the part of the country we're talking about, uh, large distances uh, add to, uh, I, I think, the, the, the distress that, that patients and, and new mothers in particular can feel. So I absolutely understand that. But I, I hope the member will also understand and accept that it is vital that we ensure the provision of safe services. Uh, he is well aware of the challenges that Dr Grace have faced, but the Health Secretary is working closely with the Local Health Board to help them overcome these, um, and that's why she will be there having further discussions uh, very shortly, and I'm sure she'll be happy to keep the member updated. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. A week from now, the Scottish Government will publish its budget, and the Greens have made the case that this needs to be a climate emergency budget. The First Minister has repeatedly told me that in the face of climate change, everything is under review. That must surely include transport, where emissions are going up, not down, and that's a result of this government's choices. We all know that continuing to increase road capacity just generates more traffic, more congestion, and more pollution. So will the First Minister give us a budget which will stop pouring money into our multi-billion pound road building program and instead commit to making public transport more available, more reliable and more affordable. First Minister. Uh, well, as Patrick Harvey uh, himself alluded to, we will publish the budget uh, this time next week, uh, or almost this time next week, so I'm not going to go into the detail today of uh, what the budget will include, but suffice to say, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, Patrick Harvey will see when he looks at and scrutinises that budget, the government's commitment to tackling climate change and making sure that we meet uh, the obligations and the targets that we have set. And transport, uh, it is absolutely vital that transport is a part of uh, that transition. Emissions from transport uh, form a significant chunk of our overall emissions and we need to get them going down. Public transport has a massive part to play in that, which is why in the programme for government we announced significant investment in uh, new bus infrastructure uh, in order to make bus journeys more convenient. Um, and we need to make sure that we've got the right balance between uh, roads and public transport. And uh, our decisions, of course, will be informed by uh, the first uh, phase report of the Infrastructure Commission, which was published uh, just last week. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. An Infrastructure Commission report which was much more consistent with the last decade or two of green transport policies than the ones that we've seen from this government uh, over recent years. The, the First Minister has kept on telling us that the government will get on with putting new radical policies in place, but we are still waiting. And if we're serious about the climate emergency, we need to give people cheap, reliable alternatives to the private car now. The Scottish Greens have made a budget proposal that would set us on this path, a policy that's radical but also affordable, make bus travel throughout Scotland free for young people, just as it is for senior citizens. Can the First Minister acknowledge the huge benefits that this policy would bring to people, like the family who spoke at a Poverty Alliance event whose son has to pay £17 a day to travel to college in Inverness. A huge cost for a family that's already struggling to get by. Does the First Minister deny that this green proposal would cost a fraction of what's currently being spent on the road building programme? First Minister. Well, we'll consider uh, all proposals that all parties put forward, those who do put forward uh, budget proposals. Of course, uh, we have to consider our revenue budget and our capital budget and how we use uh, both of them appropriately um, to meet the needs of people in all parts of the country and also, of course, to meet our uh, targets and obligations around uh, climate change. Of course, in parallel to the work uh, around the budget, there is the work to update the climate uh, change 
uh, action plan, which will be published in April. Uh, Mark Ruskell, one of the Green members, is on the, the working group for uh, the updating of the Climate Change Action Plan. So uh, this work is ongoing already. Nobody is in any doubt about the obligations we have to meet, uh, nor is anybody, at least I'm certainly not in any doubt about the challenging uh, decisions that will have to be taken along the way. Uh, and it's important that we get those right, but it's important we do it in a, a fair and just way uh, that caters for people in our rural communities as well as our urban communities, doesn't leave people uh, isolated or behind. So there is an absolute commitment on the part of this government. I think that will be very evident in our budget and it will be uh, even more e evident when we publish the updated plan in April. Willie Rennie. In 2018, after 11 years in power, the government published its NHS waiting times recovery plan to dig it out of a hole of its own making. But even the interim targets have not been met and the treatment time guarantee has now been broken 250,000 times. Why is there no recovery with the recovery plan? First Minister. Well, it's not the case, and I'll come on to uh, tell Willie Rennie exactly uh, why uh, he's wrong in that in a second. But, you know, occasionally when Willie Rennie gets up and talks about these very important issues, and it's entirely legitimate for him to do so, it might be good if he recognised uh, that the biggest pressure on our public services over the past 10 years has been the austerity that his party started in government with the Conservatives. Just an acknowledgement of his responsibility for the pressures uh, that our public services have been working under might give him a bit more credibility on these issues. But let me turn to uh, the progress of the improvement plan. So take outpatients. Uh, the number of outpatients waiting over 12 weeks has already reduced by 10.6% in the most recent year compared uh, to the last year. Uh, we've also seen a 14% reduction in the number of patients who are waiting over 12 weeks for a new outpatient appointment uh, in diagnostics. Diagnostics uh, endoscopy weights over six weeks have reduced by more than half in the past year. That's the actions that we are taking uh, through the Waiting Times Improvement Plan. We'll continue to take that action. We'll continue to invest record sums in our health service, supporting record numbers of staff. And that's despite the austerity that his party imposed on this government's budget. Willie Rennie. Time when the First Minister stops blaming everyone else and accepts responsibility for our own decisions. Because that is not the reality. The interim targets have not been met. Her waiting time promise on accident and emergency has not been met for two and a half years. It's bad with mental health. 806 children are waiting for more than a year for treatment. That's up 157%. And of course, social care is in trouble as well. Delayed discharges were supposed to be abolished by now. Remember that, First Minister? Yet a thousand people are stuck in hospital because of a lack of home care. Will the First Minister just admit for once that her recovery plan is not working? How long do patients have to wait to get the treatment that they have been endlessly promised by this government? First Minister. Well, firstly, I take full responsibility for uh, what I am responsible, responsible for. All I simply say to Willie Rennie is that anybody who thinks that our NHS has been immune from the austerity that has been imposed on us over the past 10 years doesn't know what they're talking about. And his party was the co-architect of that austerity. And even to acknowledge that, I think, would be a step forward. Uh, we are seeing improvements. I've set them out in terms of the Waiting Times Improvement Plan. We'll continue to invest uh, the sums in spite of austerity uh, that continue to support uh, that progress. Take the treatment time waiting uh, treatment time guarantee uh, figures, for example, in his own area, in Fife, we've seen a 50% reduction uh, of numbers waiting over 12 weeks between September 2018 and September 2019. That's the kind of progress that our NHS staff are making, and we'll continue to support them to make even more progress. Thank you. Some further supplementary questions. The first from John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, Scotland is about to be dragged out of the EU by the Tories. The UK Home Office says that the European arrest warrant, which has proved a tremendous tool dealing with international crime, will continue to apply during the transition period. That's not the case. Germany's constitution does not allow its citizens to be extradited unless it's to another EU country, and they've said they won't execute UK warrants in respect of their citizens during the transition period. Uncertainty also exists over Austria, Slovenia, and perhaps others. The Home Office states if a country's laws prevent extradition to the UK, it will, I quote, it be expected to take over the trial or sentence of the person concerned. 
Scotland's justice system has been weakened by Brexit. Can the First Minister advise what contact there's been from the UK Government about the significant erosion of Scotland's crime-fighting cap capability and how matters previously covered by the European arrest warrant will be dealt with in the tr transition period and beyond? First Minister. Uh, well, can I thank John Finney for raising what is a, an extremely important issue. There has been a, a lot of contact uh, between uh, Police Scotland, between the Crown Office, the Scottish Government uh, and Westminster counterparts, uh, raising our concerns about the very issue John Finney raises. There is no doubt that Brexit, both immediately and uh, perhaps more particularly at the end of a transition period, will have a significant impact on our, the operation of our criminal justice system and the ability of the police to keep people safe. And that is a, a matter of extreme concern. Uh, when I say there's been a lot of contact, there hasn't been much reassurance coming in the opposite direction. And it's one of many reasons why, uh, at a practical level, I think all of us should be profoundly concerned about what is about to happen tomorrow. Um, more generally, just very briefly, presiding officer, we've had a UK government for three years now telling us that everything will be fine and nobody will notice any difference. I, I, I noticed uh, online this morning some travel information that the UK government has put out uh, telling people what it will be like for, at the end of the transition period. Period, uh, their European health insurance card won't apply anymore. They'll no longer benefit from mob EU mobile phone roaming charges. Things will be much more difficult. Uh, we haven't had any of that honesty from the Tories up to now. It's only now that they start to uh, seep out all of these impacts. When we leave the European Union tomorrow night, let's never forget it is against the will of the majority of the Scottish people and we should have the right to choose a better future. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, in the last four years at NHS Highland, we've seen a botched service redesign, a radiology crisis, a bullying scandal, budgets that never balance, delays in the construction of the elective care centre, and now the appointment of a third Chief Executive Officer in 15 months. On a daily basis, I'm contacted by frustrated medical staff telling me of their latest problems that they are facing. Will the First Minister take the time to come to the Highlands and meet with me and some of the doctors, nurses and patients that have been so let down. First Minister. Well, the Health Secretary uh, will be meeting NHS Highland, I think, in the Highlands on the 10th uh, of February. I uh, look forward to visiting in the future myself. We will continue to work with NHS boards to support them in the challenging job they do to deliver services. And our health boards uh, deliver excellent services to the vast majority of people in Scotland day in and day out. But again, you know, anybody who thinks that our health service has been immune from Tory austerity in the last 10 years really needs to think again. So perhaps Edward Mountain could also help us uh, in putting more pressure on his Tory colleagues who've told us austerity is going to end. And yet yesterday uh, we see that the Chancellor is trying to force 5% cuts uh, across Whitehall as well. So let's stop the austerity. Let's stop the cuts coming from Westminster. And that would be uh, one good thing that the Tories could do to help our National Health Service. Question number five, Emma Harper. To ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the impact of minimum unit pricing of alcohol. First Minister. Analysis published this week shows that in the first full year of uh, minimum unit pricing policy being implemented, there's been a 3.6% fall per adult in off-trade alcohol sales. Uh, I think that shows we are moving in the right direction, particularly when compared to England and Wales, where there was a rise of 3.2% over the same period. I would describe that as a promising start for minimum unit pricing, uh, and it shows that that policy will play an important part in our wider work to try and save lives from the effects of alcohol misuse. Emma Harper. I thank the First Minister for that response. It is hugely encouraging that off-trade alcohol sales fell following the implementation of minimum unit pricing. Would the First Minister agree with me that these positive results after one year will be of interest to other countries who will be monitoring the progress in Scotland with a view to implementing the policy elsewhere? First Minister. Um, yes, absolutely. I agree with that. When I attended the British Irish Council meeting in Dublin last November, it was very clear that interest in minimum pricing remains very high from other countries and we look forward to Wales implementing it on the 2nd of March and I know Ireland is also intending to follow suit. I'm delighted to see that the 6th Global Alcohol Policy Conference which has been held in Dublin in March includes presentations on the evaluation of un uh, minimum unit pricing in Scotland. We know that there will be, there already is in fact, worldwide interest in this issue and there will be in this event and as an outward looking nation we are always very keen and happy to share our learnings with European and international partners. 
Question number six, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that Scottish prison service officers average three weeks sickness leave per year. First Minister. Well, we recognise the importance of providing a safe environment for staff working in our prisons. Prison officer sick absence fell in calendar year 2019 by 3.3% compared with 2018, and sickness absence has fallen for the last uh, five consecutive months. Uh, but prison officers work in a very difficult and intensive environment, and the Scottish Prison Service provides a range of measures and interventions to staff who require them, including occupational health support and access to counselling services. And I think it is to the great credit of the staff who work in our prisons that they perform well and good order is maintained. Liam Kerr. I thank the First Minister for that answer, but in fact last year over 14,000 officer days were lost due to stress-related absence, which is up 32%. Many of the pressures facing uh, leading to stress have been building for years, including the changing nature of the prison population, the complex and high mental health incidents, proliferation of new psychoactive substances, and the delays replaced in the estate. Instructing establishments to deplete resources to cover HMP Grampian only makes the situation even more precarious. First Minister, the SNP has a record of 13 years of failure in charge of Scotland's prisons. When will her government, when will her government finally improve the situation for our officers, or can they expect more of the same and ever rising levels of stress? First Minister. Well, we will continue to support our prison officers. We are investing in modernising uh, the prison estate, and that's important. We're also, crucially, taking a range of actions, uh, most of which have been and continue to be opposed by the Tories, to reduce our prison population, to make sure that we have fewer people who actually would be better punished in the community uh, going uh, into our prisons. Uh, and that's important work. Uh, that we need to continue. Uh, as I said, over the last calendar year, sickness absence actually fell uh, by 3.3%. Um, if we look at HMP Inverness and uh, Grampian, a downward trend in the numbers of staff days, uh, working days lost due to sickness, and the SPS continues to work to maintain that trend. We're also supporting our prison officer staff. In Scotland, of course, uh, we'll see uh, an increase in pay of 6%, up to 6% for the lowest paid, compared to uh, a pay award of 2.2% south of the border. And while I take full responsibility for what we're doing here in Scotland, often when we get these questions on public service issues, uh, basically what the, uh, the, the general accusation is, it's somehow all down to the SNP, which is why it's important, I think, to be able to compare and contrast, because we have uh, the Tories in government in England, Labour in government in Wales, the SNP in Scotland. So, you know, we can compare whether the SNP is doing better or worse. There's a report out today about Doncaster Prison showing that seven inmates, 700 inmates, are doubled up in single cells. The Chief Inspector of Prisons in England is talking about the dangerous combination uh, in prison. So I will take responsibility for what we are doing, but the cheek of the Tories, when we see the state of public services south of the border, I think takes some beating. Question 7, Monica Lennon. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to work with football authorities and clubs to reduce problem gambling. First Minister. Uh, there's widespread recognition that some people who engage in gambling activity experience harm. Uh, the SFA and Scottish Professional Football League have stated that they have taken steps to reduce the harm associated with problem gambling in the football community and wider society. And we have discussed with the football authorities what more can be done. Betting and gaming are issues, of course, that remain reserved to the UK Government, and I certainly would be happy to join with the Member in arguing for the full transfer of powers in this area to this Parliament so that problem gambling can be dealt with in a more holistic way here in Scotland. Monica Lennon. I thank the First Minister for her response. Problem gambling is a serious public health issue, and like other addictions, it is ruining lives in football and in all walks of life. Brian Rice, the head coach at Hamilton Ackies, has shown courage in disclosing his gambling addiction. A Scottish Football Association hearing into his alleged breaches of their betting rules is underway today. It is a sad situation. Does the First Minister agree that addiction is an illness and that we all have a responsibility to end the stigma that prevents people from seeking help? And does she agree that a gambling amnesty in Scottish football could create a safe environment for players and staff to access support? First Minister. 
Um, yes, I agree uh, very much with those sentiments. Obviously, as uh, Monica Lennon said, there is a hearing underway right now, so it would be inappropriate for me to, to comment on that. But I will say that I, I do agree with her that Brian Rice has shown great uh, courage, uh, and I, I hope he uh, gets the support uh, that he needs. Um, more generally, gambling addiction, like any addiction, is an illness, and it should be treated uh, like that, and we should be focused very much more on the support that we can provide. That's certainly the approach the Scottish Government uh, will take, and we uh, certainly are happy to work with others to provide uh, whatever additional support we're able to. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to turn shortly to a member's business debate in the name of Keith Brown on Public Works Loan Board rate. But we'll just have a short suspension to allow members, ministers and the gallery to change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>